If you, you guys got more? Okay. Yeah. All right. Just want to make sure everybody's got a book. All right. Okay. All right. Well, we're going to go ahead and get started tonight. <clears throat> and we'll open up in prayer and uh, go ahead and move into this study tonight. All right. So let's open up in prayer. Let's pray. Dear gracious God, Father, how we thank you, how we praise you for your wonderful loving kindness toward us, for your goodness, for your mercy, for your grace. Father, for all the wonderful attributes that you extend toward your humanity. Father God, we are humbled. And especially, Father, for what you extend to us, your children. Thank you for the love, the special love that you have toward us, a wonderful, complacent love. Lord, that is not a stagnant love, but it's a special love. It's the same love that you have for your son. Praise you for that, Father God, tonight. Lord, we thank you for the time that you've allotted us to gather here together and to dive into this new study. Father, my prayer is, is that as we move into this study that we would not only gain knowledge and gain wisdom, but Father God, we would gain understanding as it pertains to clarity when it relates to your word and as we study your word. I pray that we would become better Bible students as we go through this class, this course. And Lord, I pray that you're uplifted, that you're exalted through it all. Be with all the other classes that are around back and utilize this time to glorify you, honor you, praise you. Raise up wonderful servants, leaders, deacons, pastors, teachers, WMU directors, and others, Lord, that we can uh, utilize to continue to build your kingdom. And for that, Father, we'll be careful to praise your name. We thank you. We ask all of these things in Christ, and we pray. Amen. Amen. So tonight, we're starting our new study uh, that is actually entitled Culture of the Bible, or better yet, Bible Culture. And this study is meant to help us to understand the culture upon which the Bible was written in. One of the things that we have to understand is that the Bible itself was written over a period of 4,000 years by 40 different authors, but it was not written in the 21st century. It was written over a long period of time, over those 4,000 years. And we have to understand that there are certain words in the Bible that relate specifically to the culture. And it helps us to understand not only the culture that it was written in, but it also helps us to understand the Bible even better once we understand the culture. And we're going to strive to do that. If every one of you have a book tonight, the book is entitled The New Manners and Customs of Bible Times. The New Manners and Customs of Bible Times. This is a revised version from Ralph Gore. Ralph Gore wrote this revised version. Uh, I think it was probably around 1998 or better yet 2012 was the latest revised version that he had. But if you notice on the screen, one of the things that he does is he tells us the reasoning behind uh, this new version that he's written. And you'll notice what he says. He says this. He says that <clears throat> we live in an age of great change. And because of the expansion of knowledge, it is important to revise writings in order to keep readers informed. The new manners and customs of Bible times are more updated. It has more updated information for the person who wants to have a deeper understanding of the Bible settings. So his prayer is, is that this will th stimulate a thirst for that. And so tonight, as we move into the introductory part of this, we actually see, as what I've already stated, that God's Word was written in a particular place during a particular time and to a particular people. And that's important for us to understand. Even though that we know that the Bible today is written for Christians, right? So we understand that the canonicity, the 66 books from Genesis to Revelation, is what we have today in our hands. But it, did, it wasn't always that way. There were Old Testament writings, there was the Torah, then you had the uh, writings, and then you had the prophets. And then from there you moved on into the New Testament writings with the apostles' writings. And now we have together these 66 books. But one thing we have to understand is this, it is only as we stand in those people's shoes that we understand what God was saying to them that the words can have fuller meaning to us. And that's one thing that we're going to really understand as we move through this introductory part. One way that we can really achieve a feel for the culture is by placing ourselves back in the context of the Bible. Uh, we will look, when we move into this study, we're going to look at homes. 
We're going to look at countrysides, geographical areas. We're going to look at things that are called marketplaces. What were they? And we're going to look at all of these things. And as we look at them, it's going to help the Bible become even more alive to us when we read it for ourselves. And so that's one of the uh, goals of this particular course. Uh, we're fortunate. And this is very fortunate that we live today in the 21st century, but the lifestyle of the people of the Bible actually remained fairly stable, and it has been fairly stable for hundreds of years. That's why we can go back today and get a really good glimpse of the people's lifestyle uh, in Bible times and really see that, oh, this is what was going on because it stayed fairly stable today uh, with some of the things that have taken place. Uh, it also helps us to re recapture all of that. Uh, one thing that we're going to see as well, like I said, when we move into this study, is we're going to, again, understand the context of the Bible when it's written. You're going to understand dear, different geographical settings. You're going to look at settings where individuals lived in desert places. And then you're going to look at the same settings of, uh, in a different area, geographical locations, where individuals lived in greenery plush areas, different climates in both of those different areas also. And the reason I'm pointing this out is because this is the different areas that the Bible was written in. It's going to be important to understand too when we move in the different the attire that they wore in biblical times and we talk about that those things are going to make more sense to us as well and then also we have to understand when we move into understanding the culture uh, the poor lived a very different life than the wealthy much like well some of us today but it was very different in biblical times we understand that life in a hot valley uh, is very different uh, life in a hot valley by the Jordan River is very different from the life in the cool mountains that surrounded Jerusalem and that's something that we're going to notice uh, there was a vast difference in fertile lands between the Mediterranean Sea and the Persian Gulf and we're going to look at maps and by the way how many of you went through the book so far and thumb through it all right, if you've thumbed through it, then you'll notice it's got some wonderful maps. One of the reasons that I use this book is because of the illustrations that it has in it. Not just to look at the pictures and keep going. The content's really good. But the pictures that it gives are very good. The graphs the, that they give throughout, the, um, throughout this book that Grower gives. And then also the maps that we're going to see through this are very, very wonderful. And I love the way it's displayed. Uh, again, there's going to be a variation of different ways uh, that we're going to see. Now, <clears throat> that deals with the introduction. Another thing is we're moving into the introduction. One thing I'd like for you to do as we go through this study is get, your, get yourself your own personal journal. I'd like for you to get, whether you use a notepad or go buy a journal book, I'd like for you to go get that. The reason that I would like for you to get that is because every time we come, uh, every night that we come on a Wednesday night to go through this study, I'm going to go through a verse of Scripture. And then as we go through a verse of Scripture, we're going to highlight and identify the words that will help us to understand that culture at that time and what it means. I know that's not, all, not making a lot of sense, but let me share it, like, share it with you like this. For instance, let's take this particular verse of Scripture, all right? And boy, you can read that, can't you? So this is Luke. I hope you brought your Bibles too. Don't, no, don't, don't forget your Bibles. We're going to use the Bibles, right? So here, Luke chapter 9, verses 1 through 6. You'll notice what it states here. It says, Then he called his 12 disciples together, gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. He sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And he said to them, take nothing for your journey, neither staff, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, and do not have two tunics apiece. Whatever house you enter, stay there, and from there depart. <laughs> and whoever will not receive you, when you go out of the city, shake off the very dust from your feet as a testimony against them. So they departed, and they went through the towns preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. So again, what we're going to strive to do is that this particular study is to help us that when we read Scripture, look at key words that will identify the culture upon which the Bible is written in and then give us clarity because we're going to know what it means. So if you were to look at this verse of Scripture, 
there's one word that's already highlighted, city, right? So one thing that we're going to understand when we look, go through this study is we're going to understand what constituted a city. What did a city look like in Bible times? Did it look like Raleigh? You know, did it, you know, did, did it look like downtown Dallas? You know, what did a city look like? We're going to talk about that. But there's something else, too. What were staffs in Bible times? Were they different types of staffs? What were they used for? What were bags in Bible times? Did they look like those, you know, $1,000 purses that you put on your arm or something like that? Or, or have MK on them? You know, was that a bag? What constituted a bag, right? And so we're going to look at that. Another important key, bread. How did they make bread back in Bible times? Did they just go to the local food line and pick them up some bread? You know, how, how did bread come about? Was bread very important for them in Bible times? Matter of fact, if it was very important for them, was it a key uh, ingredient to everything that they ate? And then not only that, how often did they get bread? That's something we're going to look at. Money. What type of money did they utilize? Currency in biblical times. We're going to talk about shekels, talents, uh, uh, tactriums. Uh, we're going to look at all of these different things uh, that constitutes money in Bible times and what they utilized. Another thing as well, tunics. What are tunics? You know, what, what does a tunic look like? Uh, we're going to talk about that as far as clothing. Uh, who can tell me what a tunic is right now? The underclothing piece? One that comes on top? One that comes on top? Okay. So how many says it's the one that comes on top? How many says it's the one underneath? All right. How many says, I just don't know? <laughs> well, the good thing is, is that we're going to learn tonight what a tunic is. And so we're going to identify what a tunic is tonight. And now, when you move from there, what about a house? What did a house look like? And then when we talk about a house, were houses different in different areas or different times as it pertains to Jewish people? Did they stay in a different style of house at certain periods of their life? Or what constituted a life when they were, if you will, in their earlier life, uh, in Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus, you know, what, what type of house was it that they had then? Matter of fact, when they when moved into the promised land, did they have the same types of houses when they moved into the promised land? And, and what constitutes a house? And we're going to look at that. We're going to see those things. Another thing is feet. Feet are very important, right? Because it's what you walk on, right? So feet. What type of shoes did they have back then? Did they go to the local Foot Locker and get them a pair of Nikes and Adidas and just put them on and they walked around with a, a pair of own, own clouds and, and had plush, you know, uh, attire for them to walk around on or, or feet features, if you will? And what about towns? What type of towns were they? What constituted a town? What did a town look like? Now, this is the reason I want you to get a journal. Not only is the reason I want you to get a journal, because I want you to make sure that you keep every Bible verse that we go over every time that we come into our class. But then number two, every time that we come into class, we're going to go through a process like this. We're going to look at that Bible verse, and we're going to look at the words inside of that Bible verse, and which are going to help us identify the culture. Now, for you and I, if we're reading the Bible and we know what a staff is, we know what a bag look, looks like, when it comes to bread, we know what came in to getting bread, making bread, and being able to eat bread. And then not only that, what a tunic looks like, what a house looks like specifically, because now you're looking at Luke, and when you look at Luke, you're talking about the New Testament, so you're talking about a different period. So what does a house look like in the New Testament when you read this verse of Scripture? When you read a city in the New Testament, what's a city look like? When you talk about a feet, what type of feet or, 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 if you will, shoes did they have when it comes to the New Testament? What does a town look like when you're in the New Testament? So if you know all of that, when you read that verse of Scripture, man, it's just going to brighten up, isn't it? It's really going to make you say, oh my goodness, I know what that is. Well, if you're still skeptical about it, just hold tight, and we'll try to help your skepticism, okay? All right? Any questions about this so far? Hey, make sure you just throw your hand up so that I can see or hear, uh, uh, and make sure we'll stop and we'll discuss anything, okay? All right? 
So the first section we're going to talk about is clothing. Clothing in your book. If you, by the way, if you have your book, I'm going to follow right along in your book, and we're going to talk about clothing to begin with. So when we talk about clothing, let's see what type of clothing we're talking about. So first of all, you'll notice up here on the screen we talk about a tunic. We've already had that word jump out to us in Luke, right? Already saw a tunic. What about a loincloth? What is a loincloth? Is that something they had always? What's a cloak? Whenever we move on, we're going to figure out what a cloak is. What about headwear? What, did they wear headwear? Did they have hats? Did they have something with duke on it, you know? <laughs> or, they, or, or were they really saved and they had Carolina on it? <laughs> Footwear. Uh, one thing I want to share with you as we start, and we start talking about these things, footwear, cloaks, these were actually two optional items. Footwear and cloaks were optional items. They were not always used. Uh, not only that, there was slight vari variations when it comes to clothing as it pertains to color and material. We're going to talk about that. There are also on here types of clothing uh, that fit the climate that they were in. And we're going to look at what type of clothing would actually fit the climate that they were in. All right? So now, let's see who was right when it comes to tunics. Let's see who had the right answer when it comes to tunics. So, I don't think you guys can see this picture, but it's in your book. So, <laughs> is this right here a tunic? It's not a tunic. Okay. Some say yes, some say no. How many say no? How many say yes? All right. Let's figure out what it is. All right. The definition of a tunic. It's actually the inner garment. It's often called a tunic. It was like a close-fitting shirt. It was made of wool, linen, or cotton. Some tunics just had slits for the arms. Others had long sleeves. Sometimes men wore an undergarment underneath it called a loincloth underneath the tunic. So now, when we talk about tunics, tunics look like basically a one-piece T-shirt, but they were not made out of one piece. Uh, for the most part, there were some that were made out of one piece. Most of them were sewn or woven or sewn together horizontally. We'll talk about that in just a minute. But it's actually uh, uh, almost like the one piece that you would wear uh, as far as your clothing. If you go out, if you put a t-shirt on or something is thicker than a t-shirt and it goes down, which we're going to talk about that in just a minute, and it had slits in the side, and I thought that was going to come up. I'm going to make sure. Uh, better, better yet, turn to your page in your book. I'll help you right quick. Turn to page uh, number 11. You guys there, page number 11? Stay there with page number 11 with me, if you will. So there was also something. So we have this uh, one tunic that was worn, uh, one uh, long piece, and underneath that tunic was a loincloth. The, the thing that we can combat or, excuse me, compare a loincloth to is something like what your undergarments are. If you go buy undergarments and you wear those, uh, that's what a loincloth is. They would also utilize these tunics and they would take a leather belt and put around them, around the waist. Sometimes they would utilize that. And then sometimes these tunics would have pouches sewn into the side of them or made into the side of them. And those pouches would carry, utilize to carry things in, money, weapons, or anything like that. They were utilized for. Now, inside of, on your book, if you can look inside of your book on page 11, if you notice the man on the left on the book where it has where he's in a white-looking attire, and then he uh, has something that's pulled up around his waist. Okay, that's a tunic. What you see here, though, is that you see a man that has a tunic, but he has his what's known as girded up. He has taken his, and he's pulled his up around his waist and tied it for the sake and for the purpose of working. So now we see that. Let's move on a little bit. Tunics were normally, again, made out of two pieces that were made together. Uh, tunics uh, were also made out of sackcloth, which is known as goat's hair. Uh, and they were very uncomfortable, and they were often worn during times of mourning. Now, 
When you talk about sackcloth and ashes, we understand that that's found in a lot of different places in scriptures, right? Genesis chapter 37 verse 34, it says, And Jacob tore his clothes, and he put on sackcloth upon his loins, and mourned for his son many days. When you talk about something that's made out of goat's hair, you're talking about something that's almost like a burlap sap, a sack. Have you ever heard of those? No? I know some of the young people. I don't know what you're talking about, preacher. All right. So you're talking about something that is very coarse, very uncomfortable. Um, it is very irritating to the skin, a burlap sack. I don't know if any of you have never heard of those. But it's almost like that. And the reasoning behind that is that that was something to put on in a way of showing mourning toward God. In a sense of repentance and, and mourning for what's going on at a specific time. And so that's, there were some of those tunics. Now remember, a tunic goes directly against your skin, right? It's this one garment that you put over you and it goes right over your body. So this is what this, some of them were made out of. Men's tunics were normally short, colored, and they come up to their knees. That's usually the length of a man's tunic. Uh, sometimes they would be a little bit longer, but that was the normal length. Now, a woman's tunic, a woman's tunic was normally long. It was colored, by the way. It was normally blue. It had a V-neck uh, cut out for the neck, and then my battery is running low. Can I get somebody to do me a favor? Will you run to my office and my... Um, and bring my back back to me. Thank you, sis. All right. So hopefully my back, my battery won't die. So anyway, their tunic had not only a V-neck, not only was it colored, but it would also reach to their ankles. Here's a good picture of a woman's tunic. You see that she has a belt that's going it around her, and uh, underneath it comes down here to her legs, or almost to her ankles, if you will. Is it locked? It's locked. Okay. Just hold on one second. That'll unlock it right there. Thanks, see. All right. <clears throat> so this was a woman's tunic. Any questions before we move on? All right. Let's move on. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. Normally, uh, their tunics were made out of wool or cotton or something like that. The ones that were made out of goat's hair were the ones that were utilized for mourning called sackcloth those were tunics made out of goat's hair very uncomfortable those those were used for the sake of mourning all right now you remember jesus wore a tunic jesus wore a tunic but jesus had a tunic thank you so much see us oh. all right thank you but J jacob um jesus had a tunic that was uh not sewn in two different pieces. I mean, not sewn together from two, two different pieces. His actually was one piece. Can anybody tell me what would constitute the difference of having a one piece versus a two piece? What would you think would be a difference? It's what? Well, a one piece, anybody else? A one piece was normally utilized, or, or normally uh, uh, was, uh, normally those that had one pieces, uh, it constituted a higher price tunic. It cost more, uh, rather than just having two pieces woven together. But there's something interesting about having a one piece tunic as well, is that this, is that in Exodus chapter 28, the high priest wore a one piece tunic. What's interesting is because one of the reasons that we know and also helps signify Jesus as a king as well. When Jesus was crucified, one of the things that happened when he was crucified, do you guys remember? Turn with me to John chapter 19. In John chapter 19, we'll look at verses number 23 and 24. When we look at verses number 23 and verse number 24, we're going to see what happens as Jesus is on the cross. Who can remember that particular story? You guys remember that story? While he was on the cross, something happened while he was there. One thing that happened, according to uh, verse 23, the soldiers, when they crucified him, they divided up, if you will, part of his clothing 
into four different pieces. They actually separated that amongst the guards, right? Uh, and by the way, this was common for the Roman soldiers. If they crucified you, then they had rights to your clothing or anything that you had in your possession. It was theirs. And so that was one of the things that happened for them. But what I would like for you to do is somebody, is someone there at John chapter 19? Can someone read verse number 24 for us? Okay, so you see in um, John chapter 19, one of the things that they did is that they there cast lots for his tunic uh, because it was woven with one seam, and they didn't want to destroy that because why? It was expensive. It was very expensive. It was cost costly. And by the way, as we read where Jacob tore his clothes, we're going to get to this moment. We're going to get here in just a moment. But in biblical times, normally the only thing that you had were the clothes on your back. And so for someone to tear their clothing, was it meant something to them because they're destroying all that they had for someone to tear their clothing. Uh, but anyway, for them to do that, it showed that a one-piece tunic was very, very costly. Okay? That's very important to know. Now, we're going to move on to something else. There's the other part that's called a cloak. A cloak. A cloak is different than a tunic. A cloak also can be ca called a mantle. You know, if you go over to 2 Kings chapter 2, when Elijah is carried up and then his mantle has fallen, and then Elisha picks up his mantle and carries it with him, what he picks up is his cloak. Now, when we say a cloak, is what we can identify as a coat. Okay? It's something that goes over your tunic. By the way, look back with me on page 11 in your book. Have you left page 11? You guys still there? All right, page 11. Notice the man in the center. See the man in the center? What he has on outwardly is what's known as a cloak. This is one form of a cloak. It's cut off at the sleeves, and that's something that we'll notice is that the cloaks were made, they were made from two forms, and let's see. All right, let's go back. It was made out of two forms, but it would go over your tunic. But on page 11, you actually see a wonderful picture of a cloak, how it had the sleeves cut out of it, and uh, it would pull over you or come over top of you. We're going to see what a wealthy cloak looks like in just a moment as well. Uh, just a moment. When you talk about the country, where you're talking about in order for them to keep warm, they wore like a woolen material there. And when they wore their cloaks, again, they were cut at the sleeves and slit there. And then others uh, were a loose dressing gown with wide sleeves. Now, a cloak was not only like a coarse, heavy coat like you see on picture on, 11, on page 11, but if you look at the center and you see the brown uh, uh, coat cloak here look to the right and you'll see a red cloak you see the red cloak on page 11 that's one that is someone that's a little bit more wealthy uh, he is he is probably made out of silk and it, the wealthy were the ones that had silk garments they had silk cloaks uh, silk tunics and by them having that, they constituted them as being one of the wealthy people. You can also look on page 13. And if you look on page 13 to the right, that last picture of the man with the red uh, cloak, that's a cloak that he's got on. And you see it's over his tunic. That's another example of a cloak. What you're seeing here is the difference also in culture. You're just seeing a difference in wealth as well when we're, when we're looking at these different types of cloaks as we're looking at it at this moment. You guys got any questions up to this point? All right. While you're on page uh, 12 and 13, if you notice here on page 12 and 13, you actually see a common attire that for, you'll see common attire for a peasant man, a shepherd, 
uh, what a shepherd would wear. You would actually see here too, you would see what was constituted a, uh, uh, if you will, a uh, soldier, uh, a warrior, what he had or what he wore in that particular time. And then you would see a peasant man and a peasant woman. That's what they would normally wear what a little child would wear during this time, their tunics that they had, and then a wealthy man at the end, a tunic with a cloak, all right? So now, let's move on. Let's move on to a more interesting subject matter as it pertains to Pharisees. I know you're ready to see what the Pharisees did, right? The Pharisees wore some special additives, uh, added things to their clothing. One of the things that they wore was a blue fringe at the bottom of their cloaks, I, one of the reasons that they did that is so that they could show forth themselves as keeping the law. Now, that's actually found in Scripture, right? Turn to Numbers, chapter 15. In Numbers, chapter 15, we're going to look at these verses of Scriptures and see the reasoning behind the Pharisees wearing these blue hymns on their garments, Okay? So we're there, Rome, uh, Numbers 15. Someone have that? You want to read it for us, sister? Uh, verses 37 through 41. Okay, so we understand that the reasoning behind them wearing these blue fringes on their garments, as far as the religious leaders go, and we're going to talk about the high priest as well, is so that they could remind themselves, first of all, they were doing it in, constitution, in, in commandment from God, that God commanded them to do that. And the reason behind doing that is so that it would remind them of his law. Every time that they would see that blue intertwined in their fringe, it would remind them that they've got to follow the commandments of God. How wonderful is that today? You know, you know, wearing something to remind ourselves. You know, I have a couple of bracelets that I wear all the time. Uh, one bracelet says that Jesus loves you. Uh, that's just a reminder of my um, uh, commitment to serving the Lord Jesus Christ. Another one of these is actually has Matthew chapter 28 as a reminder for me to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Uh, so, you know, it's almost like doing something like that wearing something on your arm or on your hand or something like that which constitutes a, as a reminder to make sure that we're keeping God's law and making sure that we're living up to his word for us today, right? So there was also something that we've seen as well. This practice was intended to show their holiness, but Jesus condemned them for their practices. Remember that? Matter of fact, let's just turn there to Matthew chapter 23, verse 5. Now we understand what Numbers just taught us, right? Now, let's listen to what Jesus says. And by the way, you're going to see this is one of Jesus' uh, wonderful messages that he gives on Tuesday of Holy Week. On the third day, this is what he says. One of the things that he says on that, on that day. He says a lot on Tuesday, on Holy Week. 23, verse 5, does someone have that? Verse 5. Phylacteries. Okay. Now, when it says the enlarging of the borders of their garments, what, they're, what he's making a reference to is just what we read out of Numbers, right? They're putting, probably putting more blue on their garments and everything like that to show forth, to try to identify their holiness. By the way, wonderful, um, uh, <clears throat> wonderful uh, Bible trivia. What's a phylactery? <laughs> All right, a phylactery is actually a leather box. Uh, they were actually two of those phylacteries that the uh, Pharisees would wear. 
Uh, one they would wear up under their left arm. One they would actually put around their head and uh, connect it to uh, their forehead. Matter of fact, I want to say it's on page 307. Turn to page 307 with me. Yes, turn, yeah, 307. Let's give you a wonderful example. Page 307. All right. Now, if you look at the gentleman on the right that looks like he has a flashlight on his forehead, do you see that? That's a phylactery. It's a little leather box. What they would have in these little leather boxes is they would have four verses of Scripture on a scroll, on a parchment, excuse me, on parchments uh, that they wrote on at that time. Uh, what they would have there is they would have Exodus chapter 13, verses 1 through 12, one verse of Scripture. They would have Exodus chapter 13, verses 11 through 16, the other Scripture. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. And Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 13 through 21. All four Scriptures was a reminder for them to follow the commandments and the law of God. And by the way, you guys could go look at that, but for the sake of time, we're just going to skip over that, okay? But they would have these phylacteries. They would wear them. Specifically, they would put them to the forefront of their forehead when it come time to pray. And then they would carry the other uh, phylactery, a uh, little leather box on a shoulder strap up under their left arm to signify holiness. And the reason they did this was to promote themselves as being holy. And then obviously Jesus is condemning them because they're walking around with the outward appearance of holiness, but they don't have holiness with inside of their hearts, right? Amen. I'm with you, Pastor. All right. Okay. So now we see this, and so this is one of the things that he commands. All this, um, uh, <clears throat> all of this is something, too, that's very important to understand because when you talk about Jesus and you talk about the woman with the issue of blood, she touches the hem of his garment, okay? There's a lot of uh, scholars that would hold to the fact they touch the part of the blue that was woven on his garment, all right? So a lot of, I mean, all of this is good that you're, I'm telling you about it, but you want to see it, don't you? All right? So what you see here is that you see the little blue woven uh, colors uh, into the thread of one of the garments. This is for the high priest that they would have. Uh, a better rendition is this, is that you have two examples. You have this particular white piece. You have the blue that would be uh, woven here. And then here, some of them with longer pieces, it would be here and woven on the bottom there. It was as carried around as a reminder to follow God's law, right? And then now, here's the woman with the issue of blood. Now, there are some that say that it would be like this. This is Jesus walking, and he would have a him here that she reached out to touch. Others would come more to the forefront of believing that this is a him on the bottom of his garment that they would have reached out to have touched. Question. Good question. Good question. No, this right here is not believe what Jesus walked around with. Like, uh, let me go back. Like what the Pharisees walked around, he didn't walk around with something like this per se. That's not why he did. But it's believed by some scholars that he would have had uh, that on the bottom of his gar garment constituting, you know, his reminder of God's law. Uh, you know, it's hard to tell when you look at Christ's pictures. There are hymns that he has on some of his garments when you go back and you look at some of those pictures. But as far as like a religious lick, a religious routine, that they ritual that they would go through to hand those out, I don't see, I haven't seen anywhere where they would actually go through that process. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. It, was, it was there as probably, I would go as far as saying and agree with some of the scholars that he would probably have had that on his garment to remind him of his holiness. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Mm 
Mm -hmm. He is, the thing about Christ is that oftentimes we do get that misconception that he was just like, you know, a poor, lonely beggar. But Jesus wasn't. Um, in the sense that he didn't wear things that stood out that would make him stand out inside of the crowd. But he did have, like, the tunic. I mean, we can go back and say that. I don't know what color it was or anything like that. But we do know that it was a very costly tunic. And we know that uh, uh, he had other items that he had. Another thing that we know is that he had sandals. Well, I know that he was a costume abuse in the crowd. Mm -hmm. Well, years ago, mm -hmm. the coat was the baby thing. Was just, he was colorful, but he was just ordinary. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes, ma'am. I agree 100% with that in the sense that it would just be as common. He wouldn't be like the wealthy people that prided themselves with the colors that we're going to get into in just a minute. Uh, that comes at great cost to have certain, such things as that. But yes, mm -hmm. he wouldn't have things that would stand out. That would go back to his character. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? All right, let's move on to this. Now, <clears throat> Joseph. The coat of many colors. Have you ever wondered why Joseph's brothers were so mad with him? You ever really wondered why they were so heated with Joseph? I mean, now Joseph did have the dream, right? And he had the dream where he saw the four uh, bushels of hay bowing down before him. Or the twelve, rather, I think it is. But anyway, which was a, a representation of his brothers bowing down before him. But, uh, but anyway... We know that he had this, too. It's been known and called as the coat of many colors. Wonder why they would be so mad because he had this. Special? He didn't have to work? <laughs> yes. Very expensive. For him to have a cloak, this is a cloak, by the way, cloak. For him to have a cloak with different colors in it, it was very expensive. In order to, uh, you remember over in Philippians chapter 16, or not Philippians, Acts chapter 16, where uh, Paul goes down to Philippi, he meets a lady who's a seller of purple, okay? She, in order to wear anything that was purple in biblical times, it constituted royalty, but it also, in order to wear things that were purple, it meant that you had, it was very costly. The reason being is that the, the actual dye that was purple come from the Mediterranean Sea and it come out of snails. And so they had to extract to dye, the dye from those snails. In order to get the red, you had to extract it from a worm called a knissi, I think it is. And through that, he gets the scarlet red, and they extract it from that worm. So now you think about that concept of a snail and a worm in order to get dye. Now imagine how many you have to have in order to be able to dye wool or uh, you know, clothing uh, that you're going to sew in or in, into this uh, particular form or shape. So this was very costly to have these colors in that cloak. So that showed him to be a favorite son. So that's very important to know when we talk about colors in biblical time. Okay? Any questions, comments? Footwear. There's those Nikes. You see them right there? In order to have footwear in biblical times, this is the type of footwear that you had, okay? The sole was made from a piece of cowhide uh, to match the shape of the foot, and it was attached to the foot by a long leather strap that passed through the soles between the large and second toe and was tied around the ankles. That was your flip-flops back then, your sandals. So now, there's something that's important to know. I don't know if I've got it there. Let me make sure. I don't have it there. Okay. Where do I have it? I have it somewhere. Okay. Notice this right here. This right here. <clears throat> the poor only had clothes on their back when it pertains to clothing, basic clothing. And it was also realistic to trade a person for a pair of shoes. 
Turn to Amos, chapter 2, verse 6. And there's something to note while you're turning to Amos, chapter 2, verse 6, is this. Not everybody had sandals. So if you didn't have sandals, what did you have? Your feet. Sandals were seen as a luxury. Right? So someone have Amos chapter 2, verse 6? You read it. Sold righteousness for silver, traded their righteous acts for silver for money, and they sold people for shoes. So in order to have shoes in biblical times, sandals, it was a hot commodity. All right? So that was something to know. We think that these uh, (laughs) Nikes are expensive these days. (laughs) All right. All right. Any questions, comments? You guys good? All right, let's move to hats, to headwear. What did they wear in biblical times? When you talk about uh, headwear, most men wore a piece of material folded into a band around and then turned up to the edges. So if you see this picture, if you, you can actually look at it inside of your book. And this is a, a picture of an individual wearing a headwear in biblical times. That's the type that a man would wear. And then you also see the other gentleman over here on this side. With headwear as well. Women wore a square uh, of material that was folded to make a sun shield for the eyes and allowed to fall down and fold over the neck and the shoulders to give full protection from the sun. You'll see her headwear right here. Okay? But then there was something else. A light veil was sometimes worn over the head so that the woman did not show her face in public. Now, for a woman to show her face in public in biblical times was to constitute her and put her in the category of a prostitute. Only prostitutes would show their face, and only prostitutes would uncover and take the veil off of their hair and show their hair. The reason that they would do that is so that they could attract males. Men. And so for someone not to wear that in biblical times was to constitute them being a prostitute. It's interesting how bad we've digressed inside of society today. And what I've seen today walking around on campus, God forbid. Um, uh, you know, we need to go back to the garments <laughs> and the headwear. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, I'm not going to go that far. Uh, but anyway... So anyway, for a headwear and hats, this is some of the things that you wear. If you notice on your page two, uh, on page I think it is 15, you'll notice some of the rich headwear that some of the wealthy individuals would wear. uh, And what constitutes the attire of a wealthy woman, what a wealthy woman would wear back in this time as well. You'll see that over there on page uh, 15 of your book. That gives you a wonderful glimpse into the attire that they would wear back then. All right? Now, what about cleaning clothes? <laughs> did you go down, <laughs> did you go to your Maytag and open up the hood <laughs> and just drop them in <laughs> and then drop some all in there and just start washing your clothes? How do you think they wash clothes in biblical times? Tell me. Beat them on the rocks? Anybody else? Just let the water flow through those crows. Yeah. You guys have been reading the book. I'm glad. Yeah. <laughs> That's exactly what they would do. In order to clean clothes in biblical times, they would carry it down to the river, and they would let the water run through there. The streams pass through the clothes as to clean the clothes from the dirt. Other ways, they would take it and beat it against the rocks. These were the ways that they cleaned clothes in biblical times. What do you think about that, guys? Haley, what do y'all think about that? What do you think about that? They didn't have grease. They didn't have grease. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. 
So, all right. So we're talking about cleaning clothes. All right. So now, basic clothing. Again, basic clothing was hard to come by. It was very costly. So normally, individuals that were not very well off, they only had the clothes on their back. That's all they had. Uh, shoes, again, shoes were a, a commodity, a, a uh, if you will, a, pl- uh, a pleasure, a plush, a plush commodity in the sense that not everyone had shoes. Uh, it was revolutionary, by the way, for John the Baptist to tell people to give away their spare cloaks. <laughs> yeah, appreciate that, Sister Lynette. Yep. So, yes. So, you know, clothing and attire was very, very um, revolutionary, or excuse me, uh, very hot commodity for them to have and for someone to get rid of it or to not to do without of it or to give it to somebody was just revolutionary. They couldn't just see giving it away. So it was so important uh, were the clothes that they had uh, that, again, to tear clothes would mean this was intense grief that they wanted to show God repentance by doing so, taking the thing that's the most dearest to them and just as, as though it's nothing and to show forth repentance. That's one of the ways that they did that. They had loincloths. Yeah, for the rest of it, you could probably just let your mind go with that. You know, you guys could just come up with your own answers. Don't ask Sister Sue. <laughs> Brother. Uh huh. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. That's a good point to bring up, Brother Eric. Brother Eric brought up the point that uh, even back uh, when we were fighting the Taliban and how they made their women wear similar clothing and uh, cover themselves like this, they still do this today, by the way. This is still going on today over in Palestinian areas, over in Palestine in that particular area. Uh, That's one of the reasons, by the way, that we're in such a privileged position as we're going through this study. Because what we're looking at, we can relate. We're going to see pictures too because when the Bible was written, some of these things are still going on today. And so it's it's very relevant to us today. All right. Anybody else? Now, what about women and and, uh, ordaining themselves, uh, if you will, with uh, sort and ornaments? Uh, One of the things they had in biblical times, believe it or not, listen to this, they had makeup. They had ornaments. They had hair treatments. In biblical times. I'm not making this up. Makeup. Makeup was derived either from coil which is a green copper carbonate, green marble-like stone, or from galena, which is a black lead, sulfide, dark blue-gray crystal. It's found in Ezekiel. Turn Ezekiel with me. Ezekiel chapter 23, verse 40. See, here's a wonderful thing while you're turning there. This is the Bible coming alive, right? So now when you read this passage of Scripture, you're going to say, oh, I know what that is, preacher. Right? So turn to Ezekiel chapter 23. Does someone have that? Uh, Verse 40. Did you guys hear that? Everybody hear it? So you heard words like this, right? You heard, <laughs> you heard words like uh, the messenger that was sent, uh, and you washed yourself from them. You painted your eyes. You adorned yourself with ornaments. So how can you paint your eyes if you didn't have makeup? 
left, right? So again, now when you think about that, well, how did they do that? Well, they did that from coil, and they did that from galena that they had back in that time. Also, oils were used as a base of pigments that colored fingernails and toenails. Cosmetics were applied with your finger or with a small wooden spatula. All right? Biblical times are looking better now, isn't it? <laughs> ornaments are described in Isaiah. You can look at Isaiah. But in ornaments, they had earrings, bracelets, pendulants. Uh, they were all set with special precious stones. So you had nice earrings, had nice necklaces, uh, nice bracelets, and had stones in them too. Oh, your nose rings too? Yeah, we're not going to go down that road. We're going to stick with this one. <laughs> I'll let you and Sister Sue get together. But no, they did. They had other things too, yeah, in biblical times, yeah. They did. They did. All right. Boy, our, our time has already flown by quickly. I'm used to standing up for like two and a half hours teaching consistently. So, you know, we could go for another hour if you want to. I just don't know how many of you are going to stay, how many of you are going to leave. But, you know, we could. But all right. Any questions or comments about this? All right. So ne our next setting, by the way, we won't meet next week because we're in revival, right? But we'll come back after that. And when we come back after that, we're going to talk about what's next? Dwellings. dwellings. And when we talk about dwellings, is dwellings are going to change drastically, by the way. When you're reading the dwelling section, the dwellings are going to look different in Genesis with Abraham, Isaac. It's going to look different with Moses and Jacob and the children of Israel versus when you get to Ezekiel or you get to... Um, uh, Solomon and you get to uh, Chronicles and Kings and all of that, it's going to change. And it even changes even more when you get into the New Testament, it's dwelling places. So that's something to consider as we get ready to look at that. And there's specifics. Listen to this. When you're reading, there's regulations, rules as it pertains to being in those dwelling places. So when you read, look for that when you read that. All right? You guys good? All right. Oh, it was the one I gave you. Luke, Luke 9, 1 through 6. Mm -hmm. Yep. And you guys, got, if you guys got those words, right? If you didn't, Sister Tiff's behind you. You know Sister Tiff, she's got that photographic memory. She's got it like that. No, if you want me to go back, I'll go back right quick. Want me to go back? All right, let's see if I can do this. Got it? See, you got all these smart people. They're just holding up their phones. <laughs> Take a picture. Smart. Isn't it? That's amazing. All right, you guys good? All right. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. I give you time to turn the phones on. Thank you for keeping them off. <laughs> so while they're taking pictures, are you guys excited or just like, oh, I just know all of this, I'm good? <laughs> all right, all right. Just making sure, making sure. Gloria does a wonderful job bringing out different things. And when you, yes, ma'am. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, I sure will, sure will. All right, you guys good? All right, let's stand. We're closing prayer. We'll, wait, has everybody got their pictures? Everybody's good? I'll bring it back next week if you don't have it. I'll have it with me, okay? I have it with me.
All right, as we get ready to close in prayer, hey, please let's continue to, uh, let's remember uh, Sister Faye. She went through her surgery. She went, it went well. She's home recovering. She's doing good. Let's continue to remember Derek's brother and his nephew. Um, are they still in the hospital? Have they come home? His brother is not yet, but his nephew is Let's most definitely pray for them. Let's pray for our community, too, in that, in that sense. Let's, you know, let's pray that God would just ha- have his hand upon these individuals that don't know Christ and that he would change their lives and save them. That's what's going to change our culture, right? Yeah. Amen. Sister Dave. Okay. Sure will. Oh, praise God. Lord, they are still going to go to sleep in Richmond and keep going. Pray for a miracle on Richard's son. Third child gets his cancer this day. He was the night before. Lord, he just said if that's the case, just keep hoping and praying that that was a sign that there's no cancer or it's a very mild, mild, mild case. But um, she has an update every day. Okay. Okay, and it's Jackson. His name is Jackson Emmanuel. Jackson Emmanuel. Remember him. He's up at St. Jude. Jackson Emmanuel. Anybody else? Amen. Pray for our revival. Amen. All the lost too. Yes. Yes. Please pray for preacher uh, Jason Chandler, preacher Kelvin Locklear, and preacher Mike Cummins. They're all excited about coming. They're really looking forward to it. So. Uh, anybody else? Amen. Remember law enforcement too. Yes. Currently, yes, for sure will. Will you guys remember my mother in your prayers too? Will you pray for her, please? Remember her in prayer. All right. Brother Quinn, do you want to close us in prayer tonight?